with all the craziness that we've been seeing with social media, particularly with that of TikTok, with Facebook, with Twitter, there's major concerns over security issues, over misinformation, propaganda, all these kinds of things. And I think a real question that's being presented through this article here, which I'm gonna also give my thoughts on, is whether or not we're gonna see these essentially fall away due to regulations and does that give blockchain technology the ability to come in and fill the gap i am not a financial advisor this is not financial advice everything i'm sharing is my own opinion it's my own research i highly encourage you guys to go do your own research i'll have a link to the article down in the description below with that being said let's go ahead and dive on into the news a supreme court case could kill facebook and other socials allowing blockchain to replace them if the supreme court decides to strike down section 230 it's going to become considerably more difficult for centralized social media companies to operate the internet arguably the greatest invention in human history has gone awry we can all feel it it is harder than ever to tell if we are engaging with friends or foes or bots. We know we are being constantly surveilled in the name of better ad conversion, and we live in constant fear of clicking something and being defrauded. The failures of the internet largely stem from the inability of large tech monopolies, particularly Google and Facebook, to verify and protect our identities. Why don't they? The answer is that they have no incentive to do so. In fact, the status quo suits them, thanks to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act passed by the United States Congress in 1996. But things may be about to change. This term, the Supreme Court will hear Gonzalez versus Google, a case that has the potential to reshape or even eliminate Section 230. It is hard to envision a scenario where it wouldn't kill the social media platforms we use today that would present a golden opportunity for blockchain technology to replace them. How did we get here? A key facilitator of the internet's early development, Section 230, states that web platforms are not legally liable for content posted by their users. As a result, social media networks like Facebook and Twitter are free to publish and profit from anything that their users post. The plaintiff in the case now before the court believes internet platforms bear responsibility for the death of his daughter who was killed by Islamic State-affiliated attackers in a Paris restaurant in 2015. He believes algorithms developed by YouTube and its parent company Google recommended ISIS videos to users, thereby driving the terrorist organization's recruitment and ultimately facilitating the Paris attack. Section 230 gives YouTube a lot of cover. If defamatory, or in the above case, violent content is posted by a user, the platform can serve that content to many customers before any action is taken. In the process of determining if the content violates the law or the platform's terms, a lot of damage can be done. But Section 230 shields the platform. Imagine a YouTube after Section 230 is struck down. Does it have to put the 500 hours of content that are uploaded every minute into a review queue before any other human is allowed to watch it? That wouldn't scale and would remove a lot of the attractive immediacy of the content on the site. Or would they just let the content get published as it is now, but assume legal liability for every copyright infringement, incitement to violence, or defamatory word uttered in one of its billions of videos? Once you pull the Section 230 thread, platforms like YouTube start to unravel quickly. Global Implications for the Future of Social Media the case is focused on a U.S. law, but the issues it raises are global. Other countries are also grappling with how best to regulate internet platforms, particularly social media. France recently ordered manufacturers to install easily accessible parental controls in all computers and devices and outlawed the collection of minors' data for commercial purposes. In the United Kingdom, Instagram's algorithm was officially found to be a contributor to the suicide of a teenage girl. Then there are the world's authoritarian regimes whose governments are intensifying censorship and manipulation efforts by leveraging armies of trolls and bots to sow disinformation and mistrust. The lack of any workable form of ID verification for the vast majority of social media accounts makes this situation not just possible, but inevitable. And the beneficiaries of an economy without Section 230 may not be 
whom you'd expect. Many more individuals will bring suits against the major tech platforms in a world where social media could be held legally liable for content posted on their platforms armies of editors and content moderators would need to be assembled to review every image or word posted on their sites. Considering the volume of content that has been posted on social media in recent decades, the task seems almost impossible and would likely be a win for traditional media organizations. Looking out a little further, Section 230's demise would completely upend the business models that have driven the growth of social media. Platforms would suddenly be liable for an almost limitless supply of user-made content, while ever stronger privacy laws squeeze their ability to collect massive amounts of user data. It will require a total re-engineering of the social media concept. Many misunderstand platforms like Twitter and Facebook. They think the software they use to log into those platforms, post content, and see content from their network is the product. It is not. The moderation is the product, and if the Supreme Court overturns Section 230, that completely changes the products we think of as social media. This is a tremendous opportunity. In 1996, the internet consisted of a relatively small number of static websites and message boards. It was impossible to predict that its growth would one day cause people to question the very concepts of freedom and safety. People have fundamental rights in their digital activities just as much as in their physical ones, including privacy. At the same time, the common good demands some mechanism to sort facts from misinformation and honest people from scammers in the public sphere. Today's internet meets neither of these needs. Some argue, either openly or implicitly, that a saner and healthier digital future requires hard trade-offs between privacy and security. But if we're ambitious and intentional in our efforts, we can achieve both. Blockchains make it possible to protect and prove our identities simultaneously. Zero-knowledge technology means we can verify information, age, for instance, or professional qualification, without revealing any corollary data. Soul-bound tokens, SBTs, decentralized identifiers or DIDs, and some forms of non-fungible tokens, NFTs, will soon enable a person to port a single, cryptographically provable identity across any digital platform, current or future. This is good for us all, whether in our work, personal, or family lives. Schools and social media will be safer places, adult content can be reliably age-restricted, and deliberate misinformation will be easier to trace. The end of Section 230 would be an earthquake, but if we adopt a constructive approach, it can also be a golden chance to improve the internet we know and love. With our identities established and cryptographically proven on-chain, we can better prove who we are, where we stand, and whom we can trust. Let me go ahead and step back here for a moment to this section. Many misunderstand platforms like Twitter and Facebook. They think the software they use to log into these platforms, post content, see content from their network is the product. It is not. The moderation is the product. What are my thoughts on this? I disagree with them on this. The software is quite literally a product. I think that it's a little bit misguided when you try and say, hey, this thing that is literally factually true it is a product oh that's not the product it's the moderation there's a lot of content that's been posted before that slips through the cracks that didn't get moderated causes a huge amount of controversy at that point then it raises the awareness and there's a huge amount of backlash the community comes out and points this out whether it be something that looks dangerous it's uh defamatory, et cetera. Like it fits within some sort of a guideline principle and then there's actions that are taken afterwards. But the damage could already have been done. And so the whole point of moderation coming in is to try and make sure that as they're kind of highlighting inside of this article here that you move away from misinformation, that you move away from a lot of this like dangerous, violent rhetoric. So like the pushing of ISIS and stuff like that. There's a misconception with social media. Am I good? My throat's good? Okay, I think we're good. There's some misinformation that's put out there regarding that of the United States law and the first constitution. So the constitution's first amendment, the right to freedom of speech, this is protected against government interference directly. And when you're looking at a private based entity such as a social media platform, when you create an account, they have terms and conditions. And a lot of people don't read this, but they provide them to you and you have to agree to them before you actually sign up. And in those terms and conditions, that's their company-based policy. They have the legal right to enforce these things. Now, as far as for what kind of direction that they're trying to push content, that's where things start to get a little bit dangerous because obviously one platform could be 
heavily pushing propaganda that's all on the far right, whereas another platform could be pushing heavily all on the far left. But there are things that are objectionable, uh, objective points of view, right? Saying, well, I think this, oh, I think that. And that's where discussions can come into play. And then there's just straight up facts. And again, I, I mentioned this in a previous video. The earth is not flat. The earth is round. Or more specifically, it's a spheroid. Or even more specifically, it's a it's an irregularly shaped ellipsoid. <laughs> okay? That's to be super, super specific on this. But obviously, my point is, there's some things that are just they're just facts, right? And then you have other things that are questionable. People can have these discussions openly and whether or not how the uh, platforms really handle those things. Again, you come into the play there that it's a private company. What choices do they have? Now, also, you take into account that some people would prefer to have a platform that very much pushes their same narrative. We're already seeing that in the mainstream news. Think about it. Major stream... Uh, news outlets, I'm not going to name names, but very clearly some push very heavy on the right side politically, and then there are others that push very heavily on the left side, and they still exist. What's going on there? What's the difference here is that you have regular individuals that are able to post on the social media itself. And as this is really highlighting, if Section 230 falls apart here, if it gets struck down, it very well could be the end of social media platforms. Because I think one thing that wasn't really talked about here in this article that I wanna bring up to you guys is what about all of the old content? Sure, if you, have, if you have to hire massive amounts of new people to come in and moderate, check every single new thing that comes in, making sure that there's not like a terrorist uh, message that's trying to be pushed or that there's some like super racist thing, there's something about uh, science that's totally bonkers, you know, all those kinds of things. You have to hire all those people, right? What about all the content that already exists on the platform that may have slipped through the cracks? And does that then make it a risk where that pre-existing material, every single instance could be considered a separate lawsuit case against the social media platform? And it's just a ticking time bomb waiting to go off. Right, because if they're liable for one and they have to pay out on that, and then you've got a long list like this, company can't afford to pay off all those uh, all those lawsuits. Right, they're not making enough money, so guess what? Now the platform doesn't exist anymore. And then that comes into really a major question too about these platforms essentially intentionally trying to go after one another. We're already seeing issues with bots. So think of it like this. If you got one social media platform that's trying to get the dominance and trying to get user control and have the advertisers come to them, what's to say that they won't do something nefarious behind the scenes where they go to their competitor and they say, well, now that they can be legally sued, if there's a bunch of these fake accounts that go and stir up some things here, that could make them look like a bad guy and make them get lawsuits. And so then they have to spend all this money in court handling those things. And then this one does the same thing. And it's almost like this secret Trojan horse that you're doing amongst the competitors just so that you could try and be the only one that remains. And guess what? Even then, if you're the only one that remains and this is still the same issue, then it's just an inevitability, right? It's an inevitability, sorry. So blockchain technology very well could supersede all of that because what are you gonna do? It's decentralized, right? You post something, you wanna take it down, you can't. But there's the flip side of that because now you're on a platform where you're seeing things like beheading videos and I don't wanna see that. I'm hoping you don't want to see that. I think most people would say they don't want to see that kind of stuff. And if you can't take it down because it's decentralized, well, there you go. You're essentially over on the dark web. And so a lot of people want their cake and to eat it too. And then when they taste it, they realize that it's not necessarily what they were expecting. Tell us what you guys think about this down in the comments below. I am not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Please go do your own research. Last thing is that for Weeble, there is a promotion going on right now. I have a referral link down in the description below. You open up an account, you get up to 12 free stocks. You can also trade crypto on their platform. There's more details down below on that. 
Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. Double shout out, thank you to WeLoveSafeMan.com, Victor Vegas, SafeMan Oz for being higher level patrons. Also, thank you to my YouTube members for your support. And if you're new to the channel, don't forget to hit subscribe, hit the thumbs up, like button. God bless, and we will see you in the next episode.